Welcome, everybody. Um, we wanted to take this opportunity to do a little bit of re a refresher on a couple of topics because um, the the uh, USGS thinks that only only twenty percent of California residents are prepared for the next big earthquake. And of course, we have all been trained, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's equating to um, us actually being prepared. Plus, it's been a couple of years since many of us have had um, basic refresher in critical metops and critical um, identification of damage so that we know what to do uh, in the event of an earthquake and what conditions are safe or unsafe for us to remain in. So that's what we're going to be reviewing tonight. And I'm very excited that we have um, two great presenters. Uh, Anne-Marie Jensen is in our Rossmore area. She is a CERT team leader. She is a retired Oakland um, Fire Department um, employee. She, she, I think, Anne-Marie, you were an engineer, is that right? Um, and she is a certified EMT and she conducted emergency preparedness training in the private sector using her own company before she came to us at Cert Walnut Creek and the Rossmore Air. So we're very happy to have Anne-Marie with us tonight. We also have with us tonight, Kathy Woofter. Um, Kathy, as of yesterday, um, is a retired Contra Costa County Fire Department um, employee. Kathy has, was with Contra Costa Fire for 18 years, and she was instrumental in helping to get Walnut Creek CERT uh, established way back in the beginning. So we're really appreciative, Kathy, that you are here tonight and um, you're on your own personal time. So I, I really appreciate it. And we all wish you a wonderful, wonderful, well-deserved retirement. And of course, I'm Margaret Campus. I am the volunteer CERT administrator and I am in the Heather Farm area. Okay, so a couple of other acknowledgements right off the top. I wanna to make sure that we acknowledge our own Dr. Karen Lum, um, who is a MedOp supervisor and she's in the Sugarloaf area. Karen was instrumental in reviewing the 2019 CERT basic medical training and customizing it to make it more uh, relevant and effective for training as we go forward. So we've leaned heavily in the MedOp section of this training to Karen's work and we thank her. Um, also the Contra Costa County CERT coalition, uh, formerly the C8 coalition, but essentially the, the consortium of um, CERT organizations in Contra Costa County, they have also been working very hard for the last year, customizing and updating the, the FEMA 2019 CERT basic training. And we've pulled from that as well. Uh, and, and a good portion of that La Mirinda CERT has done a, a great job of some heavy lifting in that regard. <clears throat> Okay, so topic today, as I mentioned, we, we want to go over what do, what do you, let's, let's imagine you're at home and the big one hits. So we're going to talk a little bit about whether it's safe to remain in your home. How are you going to know what to do first? Um, we'll do that refresher of medical and damage assessment. And then we'll talk some about preparation. So without further ado, Kathy. Well, good evening, everybody. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, as Margaret said, yesterday was my last day at Con Fire after 18 and a half years doing public education, CERT, uh, wildland fire safety presentations. I thought I'd retire and I'm going to just kind of enjoy life and get involved a little bit with Livermore Pleasant and CERT. And um, with that, I'm going to start with slide number five. Okay, so there's been an earthquake. You're in bed. Don't jump out of bed real quickly. Stay where you're at. Cover your face with a pillow and possibly some blankets. Wait till the shaking stops, and then hopefully right there next to your bed, you've got a pair of heavy-duty shoes and a flashlight. Uh, we want you to have shoes there in case there's broken glass and other tripping hazards that you may walk on. Um, do not run outside. Stay indoors. Uh, stay away from any windows. If you run outside after an earthquake happens, there's a good possibility that pieces and parts of the building may fall and hurt you, so always be aware of that. Um, avoid doorways and duck cover and hold. Those sturdy shoes you have under your bed are gonna keep your feet safe and warm. Um, right after the Northridge earthquake in 1994, I think, many of the injuries at the emergency room were 
folks having their feet cut with broken glass. So keep those pair of shoes and um, flashlight right next to your bed. Check on your own family, your loved ones, your pets. Make sure that your house is safe. You, even though you're uh, considered a first responder, you yourself may be in shock. Check yourself and make sure that you're not injured before you go to leave the house. Um, aftershocks from an earthquake are gonna happen. They're gonna be unknown. We have no idea when they're gonna come. So just be prepared for aftershocks. Secure your own house. Make sure your house is not severely damaged. You may need to shut off your own gas, electricity, and water, depending upon the damage. Um, if your house is severely damaged, you're going to want to walk away from it and uh, not go back inside. Uh, turn your radio on to a local news station that will give us consistent um, and truthful updates. If you're a ham radio, FRS, or GMRS radio person, turn all those um, radios on first. <clears throat> Excuse me, and start listening for updates on what may happen. Um, the light damage that could occur, whether it's in your home or in another area, superficial damage, broken windows, uh, some small cracks in ceilings and walls, uh, minor damage to the interior. It's okay to stay in your home if you have this type of damage. Um, exterior bricks may have fallen, but your basic structure will remain intact. Moderate damage would be more, um, more, more visual and obvious signs of damage. Decorative work will be damaged. Um, lots of lots of physical, visual cracks in walls and ceilings. Major damage to interior contents, but your building is still on its foundation. Get out of the house, shut off your own gas, electricity, and water at this point, and you might not be able to enter back into your house. Um, another uh, couple of things to remember for moderate damage, the questionable structural stability, fractures in the building and possibly in the foundation, the building may be tilting. And uh, this is almost along the same lines of severe damage. You're definitely not gonna wanna go back into the building, but just make sure that all folks in the building are out of the building and that they've been stabilized and evacuated out of the area. Heavy damage is gonna look more like this where the house or structure is basically collapsed, probably off its foundation, tilting, um, most likely could, could be the source of a fire, um, could be, there could be gas leaks, water leaks. So again, if it's safe to do so, shut off all gas, electric and water utilities. Get out and stay out. Again, obvious um, major structure damage. Um, you don't wanna enter, enter a building like this. And if you're inside, you're going to want to get out right away. Uh, if you are a cert person and you're surveying a neighborhood and you come across a building like this, you may want to call out, but you're not going to want to enter at all. Definitely note this and report it up the chain of command to your uh, command supervisor. Uh, you may have, many of you may have seen this picture from Loma Prieta. Um, I believe that this Apartment building was probably in the Marina District of San Francisco. Um, it's lots of heavy shaking. First story bottom structures that are used as garages don't have a lot of good um, structural foundation in them. At least they didn't up until 1989. So the um, possibility of a first story collapse was really big in that particular incident. Now a collapse zone, especially of a building that's three, four and five stories is going to be one and a half times the height of the building. So if you've got a building that's 50 feet tall, you're going to want a 75 foot radius all around it because when the building collapses, it's going to go out potentially that far with the collapse damage of the building. Um, damage inside a building could be anywhere from fallen ceiling tiles to fallen light fixtures, definitely broken glass from windows and ceiling tiles and of course, I'm sure all of you know that the minute you enter a building like this, there's going to be hazards everywhere. Um, so remember your buddy system and team up with an individual before you go into any buildings and make sure your command officials up the chain of command know where you're at and what you're doing. Uh, ground level hazards could be anything from broken glass that have come from stories up above, uh, from broken concrete and bricks, Falling debris, and the falling debris can happen even when the building is not shaking. If um, some individual pieces of the building are still shook and loose from the earthquake, there's a possibility they could fall even if we're not in an earthquake. If electricity to the building has not been shut off, there could, there's a very strong possibility that there's energized electrical wires. Uh, the flooring may be unstable. 
um, if some um, hazardous materials have been located on site and they've been shook around, there's a really good possibility of hazardous materials that have been spilled. So keep an eye out for that seven FEMA placard before you enter a building. You're probably going to be encountering people that are injured both physically and mentally. And of course, there's a very good possibility that there's going to be fires. Um, if you're in a residential neighborhood, you're going to be encountering animals, whether they're cats, dogs, um, people that have their pets inside the house, birds and fish. We're going to have to take into consideration the, um, the animals that we may need to rescue. Uh, gas shutoff. I'm sure by now everybody knows to have that 10 to 12 inch long crescent wrench with you at all times and shut off the gas. Um, at the electrical panel, shut off all the electricity. And if you know where the water is and if there's a water leak, you're gonna to wanna to shut off the water supply also. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Appreciate sure. that. Anne-Marie? Yeah, um, that was really good, Kathy. Um, okay, hi, everybody. Uh, so what I'm going to cover here is a couple things. Um, this is going to be kind of a brief triage refresher. Now, um, with the classes that I've taught uh, with triage and ref doing refresher training, uh, triage is kind of a squirrely thing. It's kind of a hard thing to remember. So what I'd like to be able to do is kind of given our situation, Margaret gave us a situation, the ground shook, we've got an emergency, you fell out of bed, what do you do? And in using the, tree, the start triage method, um, you can actually start to assess your family and neighbors using that uh, triage method. Start triage stands for simple, triage and rapid treatment. And that's what that means because we're talking about an earthquake here. We know that professional responders are going to be delayed. So we're gonna to want to, before we take off and end up going to our uh, assigned assembly area, we're gonna check, want to check on our families as well as our neighbors. So by you in, using triage or the triage method, we can check everybody. Um, so what is triage? For those of you who, you know, kind of need a refresher as far as that's concerned, triage means to sort, and the whole purpose behind that is to, uh, when there are limited resources, multiple injuries, and the situation is time critical, you have to be able to assess somebody quickly and to be able to assess them and to be able to determine what their condition is and then presumably to be able to report that information in. And you wanna be able to you know, be good enough at it that you can get it done in you know, 60 seconds, 75 seconds, that sort of thing. So um, you know, triage works really well when we do hands-on practice, but we don't get hands-on practice. So um, this is just like a real quick uh, refresher for you. So um, next slide, Margaret, please. So when we're assessing for injuries, we've got our top priorities. We want people to be able to assess people for life-threatening injuries, okay? It gives us an opportunity to be able to figure out the kill zone, like what part of this person potentially is injured and to what degree is this person actually going to need help? So first priorities, always, airway, breathing, circulation, just like CPR, right? But in this situation, because we don't do CPR in a disaster type situation, situation we assess for shock. So what you're going to do is you're going to, first of all, before you approach anybody, you're going to, you're going to want to check for your own safety. Again, your safety is most important. So if you're checking on members of the family, members in, in your apartment building, that sort of thing, always keep in mind your own safety. So uh, first and foremost with triage, remember what you wanna do is you want to clear away the walking wounded because those are the people that are not going to require any intervention. So if you remember this from triage, if anybody can, if you can hear my voice and you can walk, 
come towards my voice. And you're clearing these people away. These are people that you're not going to have to interact with. You can send them off to another location. Now, the people who have not been able to uh, uh, get up and leave, those are the people that you're going to assess. First and foremost, first priority, airway, 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 right? If this person is not breathing, it doesn't matter what else is wrong with them. If they can't get air in, they're done for. So first pr priority is to assess for uh, a, an open airway and to check for breathing, right? The second is going to, you're going to be a, a, uh, assessing for excessive bleeding. That's the second killer, right? If this person has an open airway, but they're, they're seriously bleeding, you're gonna have to stop that or this person is gonna be in big trouble. And then the third uh, priority for us is going to be to treat for shock because shock is a life-threatening emergency that we can, as certs, uh, intervene with and to try and help with. So um, next slide, please. So how do, we, how do we do this, right? So those are our priorities. How do we do this in triage? Well, if you remember, we have a mnemonic called 32 can do. And this is where people get mixed up. So um, just kind of walk, walk through this with you. So remember airway, this person's got to be able to have an open airway and has to be breathing, right? So how do we assess somebody for breathing in a disaster type situation? Uh, how are we trained in order to assess somebody's breathing? Well, in, in kind of the real world, you know, just looking at somebody, somebody scream, you know, people in the room are like screaming their head off and you can't hear, you can't really see very well. So what I end up teaching my students is basically to assess their breathing by putting their, your hand on their upper abdomen. And by doing that, you can assess whether they're breathing by the rise and fall of their upper abdomen. Just doing a visual, more times than not does not work. People very often, if it's the winter time, they're wearing bulky clothes, it's really hard to tell if you're not used to doing it. So hands on, upper belly, check for breathing. If they are not breathing, do you remember what to do? We've got to at least give them a chance, open the airway, head tilt, chin lift. We don't worry in a disaster situation as to whether, oh, is this going to be a potential spinal injury? Do we do jaw thrust? We don't do that. We've got to get that airway open. Check, head tilt, chin lift, get the tongue out of the airway, check for breathing. Now, if this person is not breathing and you do a head tilt, chin lift, and they do start breathing, that person is tagged immediate because let's face it, at one point they were not breathing. So they were in big trouble, but you've got that airway open. If you've got other individuals that perhaps can help you, um, other uh, perhaps walking wounded that perhaps might be able to keep that airway open for you while you check others, all the better. Now, if this person already has a patent airway, we're gonna check R, R for respirations. We're gonna count to make sure that their respirations are under 30, 30 meaning 30 times a minute. And that's gonna to have to be a best guess. This is not uh, something that we do all the time, but you pretty much, if you, if you know that a normal respiration for an adult is between 12 and 20 respirations a minute, over, uh, over 30 is going to be fairly obvious. Okay, so check their respirations. If the respirations are under 30, they pass, right? If it's over 30, tag them red, move on to the next person or tag them immediate, move on to the next person. Perfusion, perfusion is checking their circulatory system and their blood pressure. And the way you do that is if you remember by squeezing all the blood out of, your, out of the nail bed till it turns white and then you release it and you count, right? And it should be under two seconds. Now, what do we do if the person's wearing nail polish or if the person is like so dirty from a, uh, 
just from the event itself, who knows what it was, right? They're so dirty that you can't tell the secondary way to check to see whether that person has a sufficient blood pressure to keep the system going is to check for a radial pulse. We're not counting the pulse. We are checking right at the base of the thumb, right here in the flat area, and we're checking for the presence of a pulse. Now you have to remember this person already passed respirations. We're not checking pulses to check for life. We're checking to see if their blood pressure is sufficient that the pulse shows up here at the hand. Okay. So if they, if it, if they don't feel it or it takes longer than two seconds, that person gets tagged immediate, move on to the next person. Okay. If they pass, they're good. But for some reason, they're, they're not getting up and walking out, right? The last thing, M, which is can do or mental status. And what that means is basically can, does this person mentate well enough to be able to follow simple dire directions? And you're not going to ask them to do anything complicated, right? It's basically, can you hold up two fingers? Can you touch your nose with your finger? That sort of thing is you're kind of under, you know, uh, assessing them to make sure that they're not sh uh, developing shock, for example, and have their mentation um, affected. So um, basically RPMs. Now, if they pass them all, okay, that person is a delayed. Now, I went into a lot of detail on how to assess RPMs. But with enough practice, and <clears throat> when we, I'm really hoping that we get back to things soon so we can continue to get good at this sort of thing, that this should be able, you should be able to assess a patient within, uh, a victim, sorry, within, uh, within 60 seconds. All right. And then we should be able to move on. Okay. So, um, you know, here's a, uh, a graphic here just to kind of remind you about the, you know, about what are we, why are we opening the airway? Why are we tilting somebody's head back um, uh, along their occiput there? It's because when somebody is in an unconscious state, their tongue muscle falls into the back of the airway and blocks it. So even if that person were capable of breathing, they can't because they don't have the consciousness to uh, pull their tongue out of the airway, okay? So next one. All right, so um, let's talk about bleeding here, okay? Life-threatening bleeding, right? Airway, 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 we figured all that kind of good stuff out. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, traumatic bleeding. And traumatic bleeding is something that conceivably could happen in the midst of a disaster. So how do we make how do we make an assessment like what is considered life threatening? I mean, it, it looks like hell, right? But is it really life threatening? So this is some criteria for you to think about about whether your intervention is going to be required um, with bleeding. And um, there's something called arterial bleeding. This is the uh, uh, when there is a wound that is on the output part of uh, part of the heart what you're going to get is you're going to get spurting blood and that is going to spurt uh, for uh, every time the heart beats because there's pressure, pressure, it's on the pressure side. So that's a good indicator that, uh, that your intervention is required because people can bleed out very quickly that way. Also, if you, it's not spurting, but you observe pooling of blood on the ground, and what that means is, you know, a sufficient, you can use your imagination and um, you can imagine blood actually uh, uh, in a, a growing pool underneath the victim. Um, also soaking through clothes and bandages. I mean, it takes a lot to be able to, for somebody, uh, takes a significant wound in order for uh, uh, blood to actually show through a person's clothes and bandages. And then obviously with amputation, that could also uh, be a, a life-threatening problem in and of itself. So those are things to look at uh, when assessing whether it is life-threatening and whether you need to intervene. So two ways that in a disaster that we uh, adopt uh, bleeding control. One is the tried and true standard, which is 
to applying direct pressure. And the second one is um, with the tourniquet. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, before we get into that, I just want to um, remind everybody that in a disaster, to the best of your ability, always uh, make sure that you are wearing the appropriate PPE, of course, of course, of course. But, you know, in the heat of the battle, um, it's easy to kind of uh, lose track of that. Um, so come across, uh, come across a, uh, a victim and you must locate the bleeding source. So you observe that we've got pooling. You've got to find out, you've got to expose the area so you can actually see what's bleeding or else you're, you're gonna be ineffective in actually being able to apply direct pressure. So I always say, visualize, visualize, take a look at what is bleeding. And that way you can make a, a good decision around that. So applying firm pressure directly to the source until the bleeding stops. Well, what does that mean? Um, I, I normally ask my students, okay, pretend it's your forearm, your forearm's bleeding, show me direct pressure. And I'll see this, I'll see this, I'll see, I'll see all kinds of weird things, but I'll tell you um, what I want to impress upon them is when you are applying direct pressure, you are applying a significant amount of pressure directly to the wound itself. You've got your four by four uh, dressings, you've got your t-shirt, whatever it is that you're using, but you're using the pressure of your fingertips against that to apply significant pressure. And you apply that pressure until the bleeding stops. If it's a very, very large wound and you want to do the same thing, but it's bigger than your hands, for example, you're gonna to wanna to double up with both hands and lean on that wound with the weight of your body. Okay, and that of course is for very large uh, traumatic. Uh, injuries. Okay. Um, it says here bulky layers between the bleeding source and your hands, which is really true. Um, you don't want to uh, keep loading up with more t shirts, more jackets, you know, that sort of thing when the actual uh, job gets done with the pressure that is applied with your with your fingertips or with the heel of your hand. So just think about that. Okay, next one. All right, tourniquets. Um, we're not, well, I'm just going to talk a little bit about tourniquets because it's one of those things that you need to practice. Um, tourniquets, obviously, commercial ones are preferred to the ones that uh, we learned how to use in uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, where you use a, a windlass and uh, a triangle bandage, you know, that sort of thing. But um, uh, just to kind of remind you, tourniquets are used on your extremities only, only on arms and legs. They're, they're completely ineffective on the torso or on the neck. We would never do that, right? Okay, so um, yeah, so the point is, is to place it between where the wound is and the heart. And uh, it's advised two to the three inches above the wound itself, never on it over a joint, because if you tighten down on a joint, you're not achieving what it is, what the goal is, which of course is to close down the circuit, the vascular, um, the vascularity or the arteries or the veins that would actually stop the bleeding. Okay, twist until the bleeding stops. Well, uh, in real life, my recommendation, if you're talking to a, to, a, uh, uh, to a conscious patient, you're going to have to warn them and you're going to tell them that it hurts and it's going to hurt a lot. Um, however, you kind of make a deal with them in that it's like, okay, it's going to hurt a lot, but it's going to save your life. You're with me and chances are they'll agree with you. So that's the reality of it when it comes to, to tourniquets. And, um, you know, don't don't allow yourself to get scared off by the fact that the, the patient ends up uh, reacting to um, the uh, twisting of the, of the tourniquet. It's kind of an unpleasant thing, but we're talking about saving somebody's life here, right? Um, leave it in plain sight, of course, don't cover it up so nobody realizes what, uh, what you have there, okay? Uh, next one. Okay, so we did airway, we did bleeding, and now we're going to do shock. Okay, so signs of shock. Like I said, shock is a 
um, potentially life-threatening, okay? Shock can be caused by many things, but usually in a situation where we're talking about a, a disaster, shock is usually caused by excessive bleeding. Uh, could be excessive bleeding or it could be a severe spinal injury, that sort of thing. But shock is nothing, it's caused by many things, but it's all, it all results in the same thing. And what I mean by that is an inadequate supply of oxygen to vital body tissues. If it's, if the blood is on the ground, it's not in your body, which means there's no oxygen going to your heart, brain and lungs. So it's a progressive condition, something that gets worse over time. Um, you will observe somebody uh, uh, is acting confused, um, weak, dizzy. Um, if you were to check their pulse, you would find it uh, weak and rapid because what happens is the heart will speed up to try and compensate for the fact that, uh, that uh, the blood is leaving the body as opposed to staying in the body. Uh, pale, we uh, describe somebody who is developing shock as being pale, cool, and sweaty, or pale, cool, and clammy. This is a sure sign of developing shock. Blue lips or fingernails, it's a surefire indicator that this person is not getting oxygen to this part of their body. And of course the brain's there, so that person's in trouble. Nauseate or vomiting, it could be any or all of these. And uh, being conscious of uh, somebody developing signs of shock is really important for us. So anybody's demonstrating these uh, signs and symptoms, um, you're gonna treat them. And next slide, please. We're gonna talk about what we do. Well, first of all, first and foremost, if it's because they've got major bleeding go going on, you're gonna to have to control the major, major bleeding first. Then you're going to want to put them in the recovery position. Couple things can happen. Okay, if that person's sitting, get them down on the floor. Okay, get them, because this is something that I tell my students all the time. If they uh, are developing shock and that they lose consciousness, sitting in a chair isn't going to do you any good. Get them down on the floor. They can't fall any further than that. Put them in the recovery position. You see that picture there. What's the point of the recovery position? Well, first of all, what you're doing, you're accomplishing is you're getting the brain, heart, and lungs all on the same level. Gravity doesn't factor in here. It doesn't have to fight to go uphill. So the three major organs are all on the same level, which is good. The second thing to keep in mind is to have this person rolled over on their side with their head uh, being supported by their arm. But you'll, you'll notice in the diagram there that that person's head is like two thirds of the way over. They're not exactly doing a face plant, but they're almost there to a face plant. And the whole purpose behind that with gravity is to keep the tongue out of the airway, okay? If somebody is losing consciousness or is already unconscious, we need to protect that airway, always, 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 okay? Also for treating for shock, what we want to do is make sure that they are warm. We, the body can compensate just, just so long for a shock. And then once it's done, it's done. And this person can be in a lot of trouble. So you can help prevent that progression of shock by keeping the person warm. Make sure that when you put a blanket on, that you actually put the blanket between their body and the, and the ground that they're laying on, because their body heat will actually leave, the, leave into the ground. You want to keep them warm, loosen any restrictive clothing. And this is an important thing too, if, especially if we're talking about like a family member or somebody that you're probably going to be staying with, as opposed to going to your assigned area, for example, if you make that decision, you're going to want to reassess these people, right? Either they're going to get better, they're going to get worse, or they're going to stay the same. And you need to reassess. And the way I, I mean to reassess somebody who is, who is in shock or is developing shock, you're going to check to make sure that they're still breathing. Okay. And how do we do that? It's just like what I was talking about before, when you were actually assessing whether um, the person was breathing at all, hand on the belly, hand on the upper abdomen, and you can, you just sitting here right now, you put your hand on your upper belly and you, 
you can actually feel the rise and fall. Okay, so the recommendation is recheck about every five minutes. Okay, if that person stops breathing, you know, you're going to roll them on their back. And if it's a family member, I mean, I know that we teach no CPR in a disaster, but <clears throat> there are, you know, un un other circumstances that you may take into account uh, with regards to CPR. Just remember that in a disaster, we're going to be extremely limited with the kinds of additional resources that we're going to need in the event of somebody actually not breathing. Okay. This okay. Is you, That's me. That's me. Thank you. I am Marie. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, um, so once again, what we wanted to do was to go over these items in case you were personally involved in the big earthquake, just so you would be able to assess effectively what your first actions would be. And so we wanted to remind you how to help your family, um, how to be able to assess whether or not you should stay or go, et cetera. But of course, as a cert, um, once your, your home and your family are secure, uh, just don't forget that we you're signed up for Everbridge with the city of Walnut Creek. Um, you would likely receive a text message advising you if we were to be deployed, meaning that the city um, needed us. Um, and uh, if you didn't receive that and you experienced 20 seconds of very strong shaking and you felt that you were in a position that you would like to uh, help mm -hmm. out, you would... Um, go, you would assemble according to whatever your area plan is. And, and for most of you, um, that involves uh, assembling at the, um, at your command post, but there are a couple of areas and you know who, who you are, who have um, different methods for uh, mobilizing. And of course, um, if it were to happen concurrent with our existing disaster, the pandemic, we want to make sure that we're still following all of those things we trained you last year about uh, COVID-19 and, um, and search. So, um, you know, we would, uh, we could certainly assemble, we would have a big job um, to provide to the city situational assessment of what's going on. That's a very, very important job uh, for the city of Walnut Creek. So that's what we would be focusing on. Um, we would make sure that if we're assembling anywhere, we would maintain distance, we'd be masked, we'd make sure surface sanitation was still going on. Um, and we would not perform um, med ops um, and internal search and rescue, but we do a, 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 we would have a lot of ability to do um, assessing what was going on in our neighborhoods and reporting up. Um, and of course, uh, just so that you know, um, some of the members of the leadership team across all of the areas are working together to look again at the ways that the forms that we use and the methods of communication um, up in the event of a disaster, but um, some of you may have a windshield survey, you may have other kinds of tools that your area has implemented to be able to reduce the amount of radio traffic that we have going on, yet to convey critical information up to your area and then from the area to the, um, the command, uh, uh, the um, EOC. So, just to go back, a word about uh, evacuation. So Kathy mentioned how to assess for damage in your home. She talked about if you're inside, stay inside. Uh, if you're outside, stay outside. Um, one of the lessons from the, the Loma Prieta quake in 1994 was that most of the serious injuries and death that were not related to structural collapse were related to human movement. So people jumping up and doing something, mostly resulting in a fall of some kind that, uh, again, led to, to serious injury or death. So it's really important that you take a moment, that you make sure before you you make a step that you're, you're ensuring that you're your area is safe and you're doing things in a very methodical, 
way um, to the best that you can. Um, and um, so the other, the other thing is mitigation of hazards in your home is a critical thing for you to do right now. So there in, in the last North Ridge quake, there were people who were smothered by falling objects within their home, cluttered bedrooms with really tall bookcases and tchotchkes and all that stuff, and they couldn't lift the stuff up. So really important to look at mitigation, bolting your heavy furniture to your walls now, um, and decluttering. So also important to make sure that you have a plan in place that <clears throat> if you have to leave your home, you leave board with a neighbor so people know um, how to find you. If you leave your home, you can put the word okay on your door. So, so people searching later will know that you're okay. Um, obviously there are records and um, uh, important things that you might take with you, but you should have those pre-planned planned and packed. And we'll talk about that in a second. And it's really important that you are provisioned now for the proper amount of water. Um, <clears throat> so I, I recently did a little um, vaccination site support. And one of the fire chiefs said, you know, if there are two things that I would tell any resident in Contra Costa County, it is number one, to make sure before the big earthquake, that you are signed up for community alerts. So whether that's the CWS system, um, whether that's Nixle or Everbridge with the city of Walnut Creek. Um, and uh, you know, there are, there's various social media sites for fire department, for police department, really important that you're connected in so that you know what's really going on. And then the second thing is water. Um, Kathy mentioned earlier, that you may want to turn off your water. In the event that our old pipes in Contra Costa County break, uh, if there's a water main break, contaminated water can flow back into your home. Um, so you really don't want that. So you have to assess whether or not it makes sense for you to shut your water off. If you Certainly you have to, if you know um, there is um, a, a water main break and, and those communication sources will uh, tell you that, but it's really important that now you have a lot of water. And the recommendation is that you need two gallons of water per person in your household per week. And you also have to accommodate for pets. Now, you know, FEMA will tell you, you only need to save, have enough water for three days, but realistically, Red Cross will tell you, you need water for several weeks. And remember that water is going to be used for firefighting. Um, and it, it could take, in Alameda County, uh, East Bay Mud uh, says it could take up to six weeks for them to be able to restore water to normal. They might be bringing in trucks to your downtown, but you'll have to stand in line for individual water supplies. So, um, you know, we, we really caution, of course, you can buy individual gallons from the grocery store, uh, gallons of water, but what happens with those containers is that the, the container degrades. So really, if you're looking at storing the proper amount of water for yourself and your family, you should be using food grade containers. You should be trying for, you know, if you get bigger, like five gallon containers, or you get drums, then you can store a lot of water in a compacted place. You want it to be in a cool, dry place. You want to be sure that you've marked the date. Um, and uh, you can get water storage devices, food grade water storage devices on Amazon, but also, you know, we don't endorse any particular source, but La Mirinda several times a year, La Mirinda Cert sells at a price lower than Amazon, um, five gallon, 10 gallon and 55 gallon drum food uh, safe containers for the storage of water. And they include spigots and everything that you need, plus the an eyedropper for uh, bleach and the proper recipe on how to um, treat your water and to store it for long-term storage. Um, of course, if 
the big earthquake happens and you're having to use water that's in your home, you're going to need to bring it to a rolling boil for one minute um, in order to purify it. You can certainly also filter it. Um, you can use water purification tablets. Um, and then of course, another method is, is adding bleach and what you're going to look for in the, the bleach and, and all of the bleach that we buy in the grocery store now has five to 8.25% of sodium hypochlorite, but just make sure on the label, that's what you've got. Um, it's the recipe is eight drops of water of, of bleach per gallon of water. And remember that is unscented bleach. Don't get concentrated bleach and make sure the bleach is fresh. Um, when I buy a gallon of bleach, I put a date on it and make uh, it often Clorox, for example, now comes with a, a date, but I make sure that I keep um, ble bleach fresh. So within um, a year, um, you have to be able to smell that smell. Clorox will tell you if you can smell the smell of ble bleach, then it's still effective. Um, but I try and use it and, and replenish it. But if you, you um, have to treat water um, on the go, you have to apply the Clorox and let it stand for 30 minutes before you uh, use it. Okay, so just to wrap up, we talked about it's important for you to sign up with all of the, the um, apps and, and the notification systems to know what's going on. It's really important that you mitigate now all of the, the furniture that you have in your home and, and declutter. And it's really critical that you have a sufficient amount of water for an emergency for yourself, your family, and your pets. Um, Kathy talked about having shoes and a flashlight under the bed. Remember, there's going to be debris and damage, and you don't want to be one of those people that falls victim to um, a fall injury. Uh, and know in advance in your family plan where you're going to go, how you're going to communicate, how you're going to meet up, um, and practice that plan. Um, also, there are apps now uh, that you can connect up to that not only tell you what's going on in your community after an earthquake, but also can help you to uh, identify for, for family members that you're okay. Um, make sure that you have uh, anything you need to be able to, tools you need to be able to shut off your gas or to turn off your water. Um, and you, you really want to invest now in alternative methods of communication. There is nothing like a ham radio um, when the cell towers are down or the cell systems are jammed. So I would like to really encourage you to look at getting licensed and getting an inexpensive um, ham radio. Okay, so that's it for our evening lunch and learn. And if you have any questions, you can add them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself.